Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Social Flight Live for EAA's Spirit of Aviation Week, brought to you by Avidyne. We have a very special guest today, and that is Adrian Eichhorn. He has done pioneering research that identifies internal engine problems, avoids potentially cat catastrophic engine failures. He shared this information without charge to pilots, mechanics, and aircraft owners around the world, flown thousands of hours as an instructor giving talks at large and small aviation events, and he is probably most well known for his flight in a single engine bonanza around the world, all to promote better and safer flying. He's worked as a professional pilot for General Dynamics and the FAA and is currently a captain at JetBlue Airways. Adrian is a second generation pilot who learned from his dad, a decorated US Army aviator who fought in World War II and the Korean War and is a veteran himself. I'm going to bring Adrian on now and uh, we will get to chat with this fascinating individual on another edition of Social Flight Live. Hi, Adrian, how are you doing? Well, good afternoon, Jeff, doing pretty good. Thank you very much. Let's get your uh, camera on here. There we go. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome, Jeff. So I've been familiar with your work, both from, from watching the flight that you did, from seeing that amazing VTAIL Bonanza, uh, watching your work as a fellow Bonanza owner uh, and in so many things having to do with maintenance. There's so much to talk about. Let's, let's just start with what, what drove you to get started in aviation? How did you get uh, at least a little bit to where you are today? Boy, I have to thank my dad for that one, Jeff. Uh, when I was eight years old, dad, we lived in Germany. My dad commanded in our airfield in Straubing. And uh, I remember he put me in the front seat of a beaver. He couldn't uh, obviously take me for a flight, but he started the engine and I remember that like it was yesterday. And I think that's where I got my hook. So dad commanded an airfield. He was an Army Air Corps pilot and later on an Army aviator and flew bird dogs, beavers, helicopters. And uh, so I got to thank my father for that because I got bit at a real young age. Excellent. That's pretty cool. And then that drove you to, and, and again, you then uh, had a, a military career before uh, aviation uh, even took, took part full time. I did, Jeff. I thought my quickest way to the cockpit, because I graduated in college back in the uh, early 80s, well, 1980, uh, not a big demand for pilot. Most of the pilots were coming out of the military there. And I wasn't a real rock star in high school, kind of a low profile guy and same way in college. So I thought my quickest way to uh, become an aviator would be following my dad's steps, um, go in Army ROTC, get commission and go to flight school, fly helicopters and live heavily after or live happily ever after. So I screwed up. I got a degree in civil engineering. When I got commissioned, the Army said, no, 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 you're too smart to be a pilot. We need you in the Army Corps of Engineers. And it's like, no, I don't want to go in the Corps of Engineers. I want to fly helicopters. And they're like going, son, you don't understand. It's our needs first. So never had the opportunity in military to fly. So after about four years of trying to get into aviation while I was on active duty, I gave up because it was just not going to happen. So I uh, started flying on my own, came up private pilot, you know, through all the ratings uh, and came up that way through general aviation, very much like yourself. Wow. And, and what, what brought you? I know you're very prolific in the uh, Bonanza Society. What, what brought you through to the Bonanza? You know, I had uh, prior to the Bonanza, I had a small flight school that I ran out in Oakland, uh, had a, a Piper Seminole, and that's what I used to teach and get all my multi-engine experience and ratings. Um, I sold the Seminole when I was transferred by the Army back to the East Coast and looked at a lot of different airplanes. I looked at everything from bird dogs to Christian Eagles to Stardusters to Skymasters and then met a good, very good friend of mine, Ron Timmermans, and uh, flew with him in his S-35 Bonanza at the time. And it's ironic because the first day we went up and it was pretty bumpy and we did all the commercial air work. He was working on his commercial rating and that mm -hmm. night I got sick and I 
remember calling my dad and say, Dad, I finally flew one of those V-tail Bonanzas and I hated it. I said, it's the worst <laughs> airplane I've ever flown. I said, I'd never buy one. I, I thought to myself, if I had one, I'd crush it with a tank and, and buy a straight tail. And then I flew it more and fell in love with it and realized that, you know, if you use your rudders, it's really a neat airplane. And at the time, I was about 1980, I was looking for Bonanzas and I really couldn't afford much because I had paid off of all of my, my uh, ratings because I didn't get any uh, funding from Uncle Sam. So I paid off all of my ratings, didn't have a lot of money. Dad loaned me 5,000 bucks, so I found a nice V-tail and that's where it started. Because wow. at the time, the straight tails, the value were a little bit higher because of the stigma, the fork tail, Dr. Killer, and, you know, the AD had come into place, and subsequently, there haven't been any problems with the tails. So, phenomenal airplane. One of the best decisions I've ever made was to buy that airplane. That's fascinating. And, and, and against all odds that you ended up going there because, obviously, a bumpy day and, and out there doing lazy eights and, and all yeah. sorts of other things, that, anything that could steer you away from it. And then at the same time, as you mentioned, that was a really downtime in the market for Bonanzas because of uh, people were worried. They thought that the, they had this AD, and obviously they've recovered from that completely. But if, if there's a time to buy one, you picked it. I know. It worked out great. And it was... Uh, Pretty nice airplane. I wasn't a mechanic back then, so I bought it without a pre-buy, which was a mistake. You know, it was a solid airplane. I think I paid $35,000 for it, but I took the seller's word that no damage history and just a couple of owners. Well, it had two wow. gear up landings, and when I got the, uh, at the time, the micro fish from the FAA, it had 26 different registered bills of sale. So, <laughs> so now here... 30 some years later, it's fully restored and back where I was hoping it would be when I bought it. So it's been right. a great journey. But great. again, it, it's it's about the journey. So let's talk about the, the mechanic side of it too, because um, you know you, you and I are kindred spirits. I uh, came up through the AMP and IA program through uh, the, the whole concept of learning it yourself and working directly underneath the mechanic and doing the apprenticeship approach as opposed to a school. And I understand that is exactly how you started uh, as well. It sure was. Yep. I uh, fortunate when I was uh, when I had my sim and was running a multi-engine operation. Uh, one of my students was my mechanic, and uh, we became very good friends. It was a lot of horse trading. I was giving free flight instruction for free hundred hours and annual inspections and. Dan Miller was the guy's name out at Oakland. And Danny said, you know, if you're going to be in aviation for a while, you might want to think about becoming an ANP. And I go, really? So that led to, that inspired me to start logging the time. And, you know, it, it takes a while. As you know, the FAA is 13 months of airframe, 13 months power plant, or eight, I'm sorry, 18 and 18 or 30 months total. And it takes a while to get that, but perseverance. So did all of my 100 hour and annual inspections with Danny and that counted and then that just led to once I bought the Bonanza uh, to start restoring it because the nice thing I liked about the Beach Bonanza is it's such a great platform for modifications. I mean, yeah. almost yeah. any airplane you can modify, but I think in the beach world we can make, there's more STCs and modifications for a Bonanza than I think there are many other airplanes. So I started looking at you know, I've got a basic platform, a 1962 airplane, but I can make it change the engine, speed, slope, window, wing tips, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of motivated me. It was my entry-level airplane, which does everything right. You can fly 20 miles for lunch or you can go around the world. So wow. it was a good decision. And so you uh, you use that time and you 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 put in all the hours that you needed to. When did you get your AMP and then and then your IA? Gosh, it was a long time ago. I can't even remember now. I'm thinking maybe 20 some years ago. You know, mm. it's been a while. And yeah. uh, you know, I had some bad experiences with maintenance at first. You know, cost the the work cost more than it was estimated to cost took longer, the airplane would come back with problems. And I thought, you know, I'm pretty serious about this. It'd be nice to be able to do the work myself and uh, control the time schedule and the cost. And, and uh, you know, it was one of the better decisions I've made. And I encourage a lot of people that if they have some mechanical ingenuity to get involved with their maintenance, to become a more knowledgeable pilot. The more I think you know about maintenance, the safer the pilot you are. 
And, uh, you know, it's not impossible. It just takes time. Our, our airplanes are pretty old technology. It's not like the fuel injection system on a, a new car. It's pretty simple stuff. Right. So, and, and you think, I mean, when, when we're flying, of course, as, as pilots, it's so important to understand the systems and the operations of the aircraft that we fly. I mean, so much is be, about being ahead of the curve and, and knowing what, you know, what, how to diagnose a problem when you're flying, how to prioritize things, what to be concerned about, what not to. And right. I agree with you. I encourage people at every turn, start logging your time. If you do an owner assist, log that time. You never know when you are going to look back and say, maybe I do want to get my AMP and now you've got a log book and you've yep. put some of that time in to get started on it. So yeah. you know, yeah. that got you to the point, of course, of being uh, an, an AMP and then an IA. Uh, we all know that you didn't stop there. So um, at some point you must've gotten the itch to start modifying these planes and which means working with the FAA a little bit closer. Yeah. Frustrating at times as, as you and I have spoke about, um, but you know, that's, it's kind of a challenge and it's the journey. The whole, this whole aviation thing for me now is about fellowship of airmen and it's the journey. Sure. The flying part of it is great, but what is really great. And, and I never thought when I bought my Bonanza, when I was looking at all these different airplanes that most of my best friends in life now are friends that I've met through the Beechcraft community, through the, through aviation. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm sure it's the same for people that get into golf and get into other hobbies, but particularly true. I think we share a bond that is beyond that with many other sports and hobbies because of the risk, the challenge. Um, we're inspired by what other people do, both in terms of making stuff. I remember going to, to Oshkosh for the first time back in 1990, and I went home and I wanted to tear up anything I ever did and redo it because I was so inspired by the workmanship of the home builders and the guys who are making stuff. And uh, that to me has been a real part of what aviation is all about. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and it's wonderful, of course, that the certifications that we get after that work are lifetime licenses, whether even if you, you don't participate for a while, the fact is whether it's your private pilot, whether it's your AMP, these are licenses that essentially you have for life. Uh, you certainly have to maintain in order to, to use them. But it, the, right. I think part of it is that accomplishment that does that. Now, you, you on, on your own, uh, created uh, several uh, what are supplemental type certificates and modifications to aircraft for, uh, remind me, was for landing gear lighting? Um, right, auxiliary landing light systems. Uh, you know, the Bonanza is a great airplane, but I thought the lighting on it was pretty anemic, especially on the 28 volt airplanes, the upper landing light, the GE bulb is only rated at like 25 hours. And with the vibration where it's at, mm -hmm. um, so often I'd be flying a later model Bonanza and the landing light would be burning out. Then you only have your taxiway and there's no lights in the wing. So I came up with a supplemental landing light system for that four year process to get the STC approved. But again, it was a perseverance. And at first, I was discouraged a number of times, and then it became a battle between Adrian and the FAA. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that tongue in cheek. It wasn't a battle. It was, it was a frustrating experience. But you know, it, it was it worked, and uh, got that STC approved, and then later a subsequent uh, wingtip recognition light STC. So um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty wow. neat. Now, leading up uh, to uh, what we'll talk about in a bit with your, your uh, world uh, flight, um, you also did quite a few other modifications, um, one of them, of course, being those absolutely enormous tanks that are on the tips of your wings. Um, the, uh, you know, there's got to be a story behind that. I have, were those one-offs? I haven't seen, I hadn't never seen those before I saw your aircraft with them, and they yeah. are... Yeah, They're that's uh, fascinating. The large tip tanks, affectionately referred to as Dolly Parton tanks, uh, they they were born in Texas. There was this guy by the name of Frank Hale, had a other a couple buddies uh, down in the Dallas area, um, Wayne Collins, Doc Wisner. Frank wanted to increase the range of his bonanza, so he was looking at tanking options for a long time. 
that were bigger than the 20 gallon or 15 gallon tanks that you could buy from JL Osborne or from Barrel to Shannon. So Frank found some military drop tanks in a field. They were 230 gallon aluminum military drop tanks and he bought them all. I think there were maybe as many as 20 tanks total, 10 sets. Wow. He bought those wow. and then he had them, he was a mechanical engineer. He chopped them up, put baffles in them, put sending units, uh, put different tail cones, the cuff on it, had them welded up by a guy up in Wisconsin and, uh, and got them so they would work on the Bonanza using the plumbing from either the, the, the Shannon or the um, uh, Osborne tip tanks. So the tanks themselves really were born down in Texas as a result of Frank's effort. And I think there were about 10 sets that were made total. I know there's one on both the bottom of, and one on the, the bottom of the Atlantic and one on the bottom of the Pacific by I believe they were both German pilots that were flying and had engine failures. So there's only a couple sets left in existence. And uh, initially when they put them on the airplanes, they couldn't get them approved. So they went experimental. So they would be an experimental category to fly with them because they can carry a little over hundred gallons a piece. Wow. So they were wow. experimental category. And then, uh, after it became harder and harder to come out of the experimental category, um, a field approval was issued and subsequent field approvals were made off of that one. And unfortunately that's all changed now because the FAA has withdrawn the ability from the maintenance inspectors in the field to make modifications to fuel systems on an airplane. So there won't be any more approvals of these unless someone were to go through the small airplane directorate and get them approved by the FAA, which would be a pretty monumental task. So yeah, and, and just to put that in perspective for everyone, the the regular e even on uh, something like an A36, like I, uh, we fly here at Social Flight, the the tank capacity on that is seven is eighty gallons, seventy four usable. You've got a hundred gallons plus in each wing. That, that dramatically more than the aircraft was designed to fly with in the very beginning. It's m amazing what capacity that gives you and what endurance that actually gives you. It does, but that comes with limitations because to go over your max gross takeoff, you have to have a flight permit mm -hmm. and, uh, and a waiver for that, which is becoming harder and harder to get, whether it's 10%, 20 or 30%, but uh, right. it is possible. So the plane has a greater... Uh, capacity than what I can put right. in there. But in my particular case, I made the airplane extremely light, um, pulled out everything out of the interior and every little thing on the airplane that I didn't need. And right before the round the world trip, I weighed the airplane and the basic empty weight was, was about 1900 pounds. So it allowed wow. me to carry, uh, carry more weight. Um, That's really impressive. Because, yeah, and I would imagine... Out, I'm sorry, stripped out all of the interior, the rear seats, anything that I didn't need, all the paneling, all the insulation. So it was a flying eggshell, essentially. Uh, took out non-essential avionics and just about anything that I didn't need to make the aircraft light, which would allow me to carry more gas. Right. Now, another project I know that you did was obviously the avionics and the instrument panel. I know uh, right. that that was what both Dynan and Avidyne, of course, uh, you and I fly, both fly behind Avidyne equipment, both there, and then we're also building it into our Mustang right behind us. That was a project that you documented and did a pretty dramatic project on your panel uh, all the way down to bare bones. Um, what was involved in that? You know, that was, uh, that was a really fun project where the payoff is huge. Um, I had looked at a lot of different solutions for updating the avionics. I had Garmin 53430 GMX200. Uh, I had the Lynx that Lynx provided for the trip, which I loved. Um, so when I was looking at options, I uh, spoke with Dynon and I wanted to make a panel from scratch and not do something like everybody else had done where you fit screens around the center stack that most Bonanzas have, later Bono Bonanzas. So started from scratch, ripped everything out was kind of phase one. All the interior panels, the flooring, everything out of the airplane in a panel and gutted it. And then it started with getting a new blank panel and cutting the uh, panel to fit 
the three screens. And uh, you know, the nice thing, I, I, my weak, my, my strength when it comes to um, my skills is sheet metal work. Um, troubleshooting and electronics is a weak area for me. So what was really um, nice about the Dynon products is most of it is just cables and interconnect and connecting boards. So uh, I had a friend, Mel Jordan, uh, that Dynon had connected me with. Mel is a home builder, very familiar with the Dynon product, who came up from the Phoenix area and spent a couple days with me. And about the only harness we needed to make for the whole entire insulation was the harness to have the audio panel, the Avidine uh, 550, IDF 550 navigator talk with the Dynons. And we started on a, like a Thursday morning and by about 10 o'clock the harness was done and, and it was in. Everything, wow. else, everything else was just mounted and supplied by Dynon. So the whole Dynon Avidine solution is absolutely phenomenal. And you yeah, said that yes. you had a 530 before that in, in there. So therefore, the IFD 550 obviously is a slide-in replacement with the, uh, so you, you can do that and then you can add whatever connectors. And I guess that's what you're talking about is adding in some additional pins, even though it's, it's slide-in. Um, right, so. but I had pulled all that out. All of the oh. Garmin equipment was out. So I started from scratch with the uh, Avidine unit. And, uh, you know, talking about that unit, I absolutely love it. I only have one navigator in there because of each, each of the screens has their own GPS and AHARs. So okay. I have a Dynon comm and the Avidine comm. So I have two comms and only one navigator, which was need for certification. I, I didn't really see the need to have another, say, 430 or 530. I wanted to save weight, save panel space, save wiring. So that unit drives the Avidine in, and I absolutely love it. I think the blend of buttons and screens where it's not just touchscreen is superior to the Garmin product. Um, I like the screens, and most importantly, is having flow and FMS and a number of corporate jets and in the Airbus of JetBlue. The logic with the Avidine is more consistent with the logic of the FMSs that I have. So, you know, it's one solution. There's a lot of them out there, but I... 100% love the setup. Both the Dynon products and the Avidine pro products to me are superior than any of the other stuff out there. Yeah, I mean, I agree as well. It's interesting because it, it's easy uh, when looking at all the different things like what you can put in front of you, as you mentioned with Dynon, there's other products out there for primary displays, for multifunction displays, etc. There's there's many options out there, but that's not the case when you start talking about the need for an actual FMS, an actual flight management system that can right. fly, I help give you guidance on IFR approaches, be certified. And uh, Avidon's one of the only providers of that, and I think what they've created in that unit um, is extremely easy to use. Um, to me, it's interesting because uh, so many of the things uh, that have that have evolved in technology in the cockpit give you so many more features, but it also can raise the training uh, requirement and put a lot of currency challenges in front of you. Um, uh, people have said about flight decks in the past, like steam gauges don't require as much recurrent training as right. when you know uh, whole glass panels came in. To me, the Avidine units kind of step back a bit from that because it's just, it's logical to me. And the few times I've been hit with something that was a surprise that maybe I haven't done in a long time, like a, a hold that I wasn't planning for, I was able yeah. to figure it out quickly, which is good. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, it, it's a great interface. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, and Garmin is a phenomenal product, but I just got tired. It seemed like and I went from King Radios, spent a fortune for all the Garmin products. And I know time goes go by quicker than I'd like it to, but it seems like, okay, everything that's in my panel is no longer made and it's not going to be supported very long. And that's our industry. So I got sick and tired of, of that always happening. And I know in the case of the, uh, the Dynon screens is the screens are pretty much not going to change much over time. The software updates because it's put in under an STC, um, they're allowed to do that, like making changes to your iPad. They don't have to go back to the FAA and go through this whole certification problem to make a change for, to the software that's on the screen. And I, I just like the fact to have an airplane 
with a product in it that is other than the, the industry gorilla out there to show the capabilities. And it's remarkable how reliable it is and the, the quality and the touch of the buttons and everything. It's, it's yeah. a great year. <laughs> Great. Yeah, the hyper touch system is quite good, and I and as you mentioned, I also like the fact that you have a dis, kind of distributed panel, uh, essentially best of breed. You can plug and play all different products, and and, and yeah. they all play together, which is helpful. You don't have to rely on on one brand. So at some point, then you 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 made a decision uh, to do this epic trip uh, around the world uh, using you you now you've got the aircraft. It's got its avionics capabilities. It's got these tip tanks that can feed the world fuel. And um, uh, what made you decide to take on this challenge? You know, Jeff, it was one of those things. Um, uh, as an aviator, I like to always challenge myself. Early on, it was getting an additional rating um, to, to just increase your skills and your knowledge as an aviator. So after I started flying corporate and then for the airlines, I thought there's really not a lot much more that I can do in terms of getting ratings and learning stuff other than maybe go the seaplane route or sail planes. But I thought, you know, I've got this airplane that's capable. Um, well, let me back up. In 2011, there were three of us. We took three bonanzas. We went up to up through uh, Canada to to um, uh, um, not a, uh, I'm throwing a blank. Uh, it cal well, we went up and we flew across the North Atlantic over to Greenland and back. Oh, wow. We started on a Monday and by, by Friday we were home with three bonanzas with no other reason other than to just fly and see Greenland and share the fellowship of airmen. So we went up there and that was a great trip. And I knew when I got back from that, that there, there's more long distance flying in my future. Um, mm. Using a general aviation airplane for a trip like that, it's it's really epic for the people that are thinking about it. They need to do it. Right. Um, it and just, I understand you had a personal motivation in your uh, motivation in your personal life to make that decision as well. Yeah, I did. Unfortunately, uh, four years ago, I lost my mother and sister. Um, they passed away four days apart from each other. And after that, I thought, you know. This has been a bucket list item to fly around the world. And I thought at the time, there's nothing that's keeping me from doing it other than myself. But that said, I thought, I don't know how I'm gonna get the time off of work. I don't know how I'm gonna afford it. It's very expensive to do so because the insurance alone now is cost prohibitive for most people. And I thought, and I don't know how I'm gonna equip the airplane with enough gas to get through the Pacific. There's not a lot of ways to get around the world um, every route has some pluses and some minuses, but getting through the Pacific is probably the easiest way in terms of avgas and clearances and, and avoiding uh, restrictions and things that are just deal breakers. So, so one thing led to another. And once I made the decision to do it, I thought, I can figure this out. We live in the United States. We have more freedom than anybody else. And we have the internet, there's a lot of people to talk with. So I thought, gonna do it. And then uh, the challenge, one thing that was uh, a hurdle at first was overcome. And JetBlue was great with giving me some time off. I, I saved a lot of leave and I bid my schedule. So I had the last part of one month off and the first part. So I only had to use about four days worth of leave uh, to get back. and. And it all worked out. So it's one of those things that you may not be able to get your arms around it at first when you're thinking about doing something, but when you put your mind to it and make that commitment and stick with it, it can be done. Wow. So wow. a lot of perseverance there. And that was uh, looking back in a lot of ways, the most fun part of the trip, the challenge of planning it. And, and a lot of people have asked me, well, what was the most memorable thing on the trip? What was your, what are you most proud of your accomplishments and and I'll say it doesn't have much to do with the trip because with GPS navigation the route in navigating is is quite easy um, unlike Frank and Wayne the initial earth rounders and bonanzas they didn't they didn't even have Loran when they were doing it wow. and when they were doing it 30 years ago everybody loved Americans and when they landed they were almost national heroes they were treated <laughs> like kings well, their problems were on the ground or in the air, not on the ground. Now it's the other way around. 
the navigational part is easy. The country clearances, the permits, and what's going to happen on the ground is the challenge of it. And that's the part that's not fun because you've got to fly through different parts of the country that or world that are really not pro-American. Mm. I didn't have any bad experiences um, and thankful for that. But the fun part looking back for me was the planning, um, deciding how I'm going to overcome these challenges and, and, and also having built and modified an airplane that, that ran with only one small problem is probably what I'm most proud of, that the plane performed flawlessly. And some people say, well, how do you, how do you come to terms with flying 17 hours across the open ocean, say from Hawaii back to Oakland? Aren't you afraid to fly across water? And the answer to that was absolutely not because you know my involvement with bore scoping the engine I had built that engine and I had 100% confidence in it because what I know as a mechanic on how to test an engine to see whether it's safe for operation. And, and I look back, I tell a lot of people, my dad lived in Michigan and we started flying to Oshkosh in the early 90s. Well, between where my father lived and Oshkosh is Lake Michigan, this big body of water. And uh, I remember we'd climbed a 12, 14,000 feet to cross a 65 mile stretch of water that was warm and with no sharks. In the <laughs> and we were scared to do that, but that's because I didn't know what I know now about assessing the health of an engine through bore scope and an oil analysis, filter analysis, compression tests and all that. So yeah, I think that's where the years of experience have paid off, but uh, is a, a amazing journey and the next epic journey is to go over the North Pole via uh, Iceland, Norway, over the pole to Fairbanks, Alaska with three other bonanzas, Matt Guntmiller, um, Mark Merrill out of California and Adam Broom out of North Carolina. So we're going to do a formation flight with four bonanzas and go over the pole. So we, oh my God. we were planning to go on the 5th of this May, but because of the pandemic, the trip was delayed. So we're planning to leave next year. Uh, and hopefully things will be somewhat back to normal. Wow, that is so impressive. Now, I, I, th I have to go back to your trip around the world, though, because there is this one of the most uh, gorgeous photos uh, that I have probably ever seen that involves a, a Bonanza at all is the photo of your aircraft over the American Cemetery at Omaha Beach um, in Normandy. What, it, it, obviously, uh, that uh, it must have been something that, that got put together somehow because um, yeah, I'm sure, sure it wasn't just a drone that happened to be flying overhead for that. What, what's no, and I have to thank Tom Haynes from AOPA because uh, I had, when I was talking with Tom before the trip, I said, Tom, I know this will probably never happen because I just assumed that the airspace over Normandy would be impossible to fly through. So I had mentioned that to Tom before the trip. And uh, Tom came over and he met me in Normandy and we flew all the way down to Egypt together via um, uh, Frederikshavn, Germany, uh, Thessaloniki, Greece, Santorini, and then Egypt. And then Tom went home. But Tom wrote a story for AOPA about user fees and flying in Europe. And that was really the only part of the trip where I could carry another person because my fuel loads weren't very um, or heavy. I didn't carry a lot of fuel on those legs. So, so Tom had arranged with uh, Ian Sagan um, and Ed Hicks from Flyer Magazine in the UK. They flew over in a Cessna 182 and they met us in Deville, in the airport near Normandy. And we did that photo mission. It was about uh, an hour and a half of flying and, and uh, Ed Hicks, the photographer, took a whole bunch of pictures and that was his work that he did. Mm. And that was probably, that was without question, the most memorable part of the whole trip because being an army guy and a paratrooper and knowing about D-Day and the loss of 10,000 soldiers during the invasion, it's, it's pretty sobering when you're on the ground, but to see it from the air and flying at the same altitude at 1,200 feet that the paratroopers jumped from when they crossed the beach, it was uh, pretty cool. Well, yep, that's, very that's memorable nice. part of the trip. Now, you there, you have basically coined a term that you've used with almost everything that that you've done of this fellowship 
of aviators. Tell me a little bit about that. You know, it's, uh, it's neat how in aviation I found over the years that people pull together to help each other, whether it's planning a journey, whether it's working on an airplane, whether it's getting a rating, or it's just sharing the, the, the fellowship that we all enjoy. Um, I think it's great. You know, that's, that for me is the really fun part about being in aviation at this point in my life, you know. And, and like I said earlier, I think we share a bond that is probably a little bit stronger than people that are in other hobbies or, or sports just because of the risk, the challenge, whether it's uh, performance of an airplane, whether it's weather, what you, any name. It, it's, uh, it's, a, it's something for me that I would not be where I'm at without the help of a lot of aviators, both with getting my mechanics license back to Danny motivating me to do it and then working with other IAs along the way to log the time and to help uh, allow me to work under their supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it came time to modify the airplane on my Five Blue Horizons website, you can click on a link that talks about aircraft restoration and you can see all the photograph of guys that have helped me, Bob Pastusik, Ed, uh, Smith out of Norfolk with rebuilding the engine a month before we left because I found a cracked cylinder and I realized that I had channel chrome cylinders and on my long legs, channel chrome cylinders typically burn more oil than they do with a steel cylinder that I'd probably run out of oil before I ran out of gas. So, so many people have helped me with working on the airplane. When I'm in a bind, Phil McClanahan at Manassas would come by and we'd work till wee hours of the morning fixing things. And, and those are the guys that I refer to when I'm talking about fellowship of airmen. It's wow. Great. Uh, it, it's I'm really sure true. You know, there's so many programs and EA has done a wonderful job with Young Eagles. There's so many programs that are dedicated towards bringing people into aviation and, and kids and things like that. But I think, um, it's almost a little bit uh, uh, underestimated and, and possibly underappreciated how significant the mentorship is and the fellowship is that, as you mentioned, happens uh, for all of us within aviation. Um, I, I, I don't know any, any of these people who are whose names are common household names in aviation, such as yourself. W would we be here? If it um, if it weren't for all of these other mentors and people that have helped us along the way, oh, I totally agree, Jeff. And and you came up through maintenance on your own, and and uh, I I couldn't agree more. And that's that's really the great part when you go to the AOP regional fly-ins and to Air Venture. It's kind of I've always called those those are adult summer camps. It's where we, <laughs> you know, I remember years ago I sh I showed. Uh, um, Paul Poparenzi, my airplane, and he came down because our Bonanzas to Oshkosh formation flight, they would always come down, and I cornered him. I was so proud to show him the, the Bonanza after I redid the engine compartment, and we talked for a while, and he said, you know, he, he said something that has resonated with me ever since. He said, over the years, he had learned a lot about airplanes, but even more about people, <laughs> and, and that's, what it, that's what it's all about. It's just we have this common friendship and bond that's it's really great and i know when i run into guys now that are airline pilots or corporate pilots that were students of mine back when i was teaching in the seminole or i'll run into a guy that's now running his own shop he's got his a and p and his ia who i helped mentor to become a mechanic that's man that's where you feel good really i i i, I couldn't agree more i, I you know, that's why uh, we created Social Flight, specifically to bring people together, to get people flying yes. more, to give people missions. Uh, because ultimately, uh, it, it's so it's been so challenging during the pandemic, of course. But ultimately, when you can connect people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, they, they're standing next to each other, they're looking at an airplane, they end up striking up a conversation, one person helps another, and before you know it, 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 it's amazing. Projects get finished, aircraft get worked on, ratings get held, and as you mentioned, so many things of, of what you created even were swapping uh, your time versus someone else's time. It, it's, right. it's truly inspirational. 
You know, Jeff, and what we don't realize here, we take it for granted because all of us growing up, we've always had access to general aviation airports, and we've always known somebody that's a private pilot or something. And you go to other parts of the world, and that's probably one of the things on the round the world trip that was most, uh, oh, probably the biggest eye opener for me was how few countries outside of the United States have the general aviation uh, freedom and, and access like we do. An example is when Tom and I were in Egypt, we had uh, dinner with Eddie Gould, who was one of the handlers that I use with General Aviation Support Egypt. And we went to dinner one night with this doctor, a heart surgeon who owns a 172, who at the time was the only airplane owner in Egypt. <laughs> now, think about this. We were at 6 October Airport, which is right outside the city of Cairo, which is approximately 20 million people. And I asked him and Eddie Gould roughly how many licensed pilots there were in Egypt. And the answer was five. Oh my God. Five licensed pilots. So, and I know when I was flying there, there's no there's no flight below 8,000 feet. Everything is IFR. It's mostly one-way airways, and it's very prohibitive and very expensive. So we kind of take for granted out here, you know, well, there's a little airport 10 miles out of town. I've never been there, but I know people that fly there, and it's just a freedom <laughs> that is experienced nowhere else in the world like it is here. And I, I hope you know, AOPA, EAA, and all the great organizations continue to protect our freedom. And I really appreciate what, what you're doing in helping getting people into it to really enjoy what this is all about. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Adrian Eichhorn, I, you've been an inspiration. So many of the things that you've done, whether it's through maintenance, modifications, teaching people and instructing, and of course, uh, the journeys that you've taken uh, uh, both around the world. And it sounds like uh, a pretty uh, impressive one that I'll be following you on uh, as well coming up. Um, I definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much for being part of this show uh, and uh, a very special edition of Social Flight Live, of course, for EAA's Spirit of Aviation Week. And again, thank you so much also to Avidyne for uh, making all of this possible. I hope that we'll uh, have an opportunity to have you back on uh, as part of our regular series. Well, thanks a lot, Jeff. I've been one lucky guy, you know, living a childhood dream. Um, are, do we have a few more minutes or are we out of time? Uh, go ahead. Absolutely. Well, it's just, I like I mentioned yesterday, I actually just retired from JetBlue, took an early out, and uh, got hired by Lidos, a large science and technology company. I'll be flying a Dash 8 for the Army on an Army mission, an Army airplane with an Army call sign. And I just think it's a great chapter after... 40 years of being out of college to now actually fly for the Army, which is what I've wanted to do since I was eight years old. And it's just, it just shows that in aviation, and I, and I wanted to bring this up because I know there's a lot of young people that have got on the bandwagon in the last couple of years, may have gotten hired, and they had stars and dreams of upgrading quickly in that. This is a speed bump. Um, with all the retirements and all the guys that are taking early outs, those guys just, the advice I can give to them is keep flying, keep getting ratings, work anywhere you can, regardless of cost or sacrifice, stay current, get the experience, because you have no idea what doors are gonna open for you. If you would have told me when I graduated from college that I would never be an aviator in the Army, but after I graduated from the Army, I would fly for the Washington Redskins, for NASA, the FAA, General Dynamics, and then JetBlue. And then 40 years later for the Army, I would have said, <laughs> whatever you're drinking, I'd like a drink of that because that'll never happen. So this is a new chapter. I'm really excited about it. I'm hoping it leads to rotational flying and an appointment in either Afghanistan or to Iraq to, to be able to fly and support my country. and. Uh, it's pretty wow. exciting. Well, congratulations on having that happen, and and uh, and, and of course, th th thank you for the service that you have yet to do now, still as part of uh, of these missions in support of the military and in support of the country. It it is amazing that um, I think even during such challenging times that challenge all of us, and especially our vulnerable world of general aviation, that there is uh, there is silver linings. There are opportunities. That, oh, uh, that all of these things present. 
Absolutely, and especially in America, like no other country. And we're so fortunate. So hopefully this pandemic will be over and next year we'll be at Oshkosh and sharing some of that fellowship airmen in person, you know. Excellent. Excellent. Well, looking forward to seeing you next time in person. And uh, again, to everyone out there, uh, we will have uh, the remainder of all of these fascinating programs as part of EAA Spirit of Aviation Week brought to you by Avidine. And then we will resume with the, our regular Social Flight Live. Just go to socialflightlive.com and we will continue those programs. Until next time, thank you so much, Adrian, for joining us. I'm and Jeff thank Simon. You, Jeff. Thank Blue you. skies.